à tous. Merci de votre participation. Pour écouter notre session en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interprétation et sélectionnez le drapeau français. Hello, bonjour, how are you, Leo? My name is Kevin Mutia. Solofina Nekesa. Lauren Arnza. Ryan Fisher, Professional Officer at Ikle Africa. On behalf of Ikle Africa, the African Center for Cities, our future cities, and partners, I am excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2021 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing as a platform of thinkers, doers, enablers, committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. Rise Africa is about building active networks across academia, government, private sector, civil society, and the arts. Our entry point is based not on, on articulating problems followed by proposing solutions, but rather on celebrating our cities as places of innovation and culture, while asking what more we can do to make them sustainable, inclusive, and vibrant. This festival is hosting 46 sessions over five days from across 16 countries in Africa and the world. Every session aims to share new ideas, showcase ongoing actions, and launch new initiatives by bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you to commit to one or more specific actions that you or your organizations will take on. As this session closes, you will be redirected to a survey in which you can articulate these actions. We will follow up on these committed actions throughout the year and offer resources, connections, and support. In this way, we are testing the idea that events can galvanize action, and we hope that you will join us in this effort. Beyond this session, there are many ways to take part in the festival. Register for further sessions. Vote for your favorites in the photo competition. Test your knowledge of African cities from our daily quiz. Watch a variety of inspiring video provocations. And listen and dance to the Rise Africa 2021 playlist. We hope that you will make all attempts to reach out to new people and build lasting connections. Before we begin, it's important to note that this session is being recorded and that by participating, you are consenting to be recorded. All recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. Creative expression is vital for creating new futures for our cities. So we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. One, when people ask me where I'm from, I tell them, I am from red dirt and green hills, endless mango trees whose small sun of a fruit is always within arm's reach, smells so sweet your stomach speaks in small roars of impatience as you sip your cup of chai waiting for meals to finish cooking. I am from the sounds of my people, languages so rhythmic you think we spoke in song, the melodies of matatu conductors waving on crowded city streets, and the crow of roosters calling the sun from behind the horizon in the village. Two, when people ask me where I am from, I tell them, I am from a country mispronounced into modernity by wandering white men, from big men with small minds who stole the spoils of our struggles with no shame or foresight. I tell them I come from those who resisted, those whose dreams defied their bullets even after their breath was stolen from their bodies. Three, when people ask me where it is I'm from, I tell them I am from a new story about this country, this continent, this world, a new tale told by new authors, unafraid to wield the pen as a small sphere, our ancestors as shield, our history as armor, as we use our words to help write this world anew. Awesome, awesome. Uh, greetings, special greetings from East Africa. I am Eddie Jemba, and I'll be your facilitator today. Uh, habari. Uh, now, what else can I say? Um, bo bonjour to the other Western part of Africa, and uh, see ya bonga. Yeah. Uh, oh, saubona, even better. Um, greetings, greetings on this particular Africa Day. We are going to be celebrating. I hope you have something to remind you of the wonderful memories of Africa. And we will be giving you a very wonderful treat with uh, what we call Akatogo in my language. So I am from Uganda and I'm calling in from Uganda. And when we say Katogo, that means a mix of very delicious food. 
So I see this particular session as a mix of wonderful food. I would like to request you to introduce yourselves. What's your name? What, what, what do you do? And above all, to remind us of the wonderful Africa Day, a very special saying which you hold dearly. Uh, maybe it's from your mother tongue or from your father tongue or from elsewhere in Africa, but it would be nice to have uh, a couple of sayings here. What's your favorite saying? What's your favorite African saying? Or if you do not have a favorite African saying, you can tell us. What does Africa mean to you? With that, I want to say you are most welcome and feel at Africa today. We have a very um, elaborate uh, and well thought through agenda. And right now, as I've already said, please introduce yourself in a chat, in a chat right in the I think this is the right hand. Maybe on your screen, this is the left hand. But on my screen, left hand corner down. You type your name as I am doing. Um, yes, Eddie Jemba, uh, working with the Red Cross Climate Center, Urban Resilience Advisor, and my favorite saying is, um, in Luganda we say konoweka toka linda kusaba nataka, literally translated, if you want to carry a child, then don't wait for them to get dirty. Hmm? Wait for them to get dirty. There you go, please, please, please. Come on, uh, introduce yourselves. And then without, as, as the introductions go on, I would like to introduce my co-facilitator for the next session. We are going to be having, uh, to break this into two sessions. One is going to be about African urban narratives, African urban narratives through literature, gender, youth, and movement. What a way to celebrate the Africa Day. And that session will be uh, facilitated by Pato. And, and then later we will have another one session entitled Portraits of Our African Cities, Urban Development Reflections Through Art and Photography. Throughout the session, we are asking ourselves, how can art, how can creative expressions, creative narratives be, uh, be useful to building resilient cities, resilient communities? Without further waiting, may I invite Pato to take over. Pato, over to you. Thank you, Eddie. So I'm going to start this by throwing out a couple of questions that we should maybe think about as the session goes on. What is the role of art, literature, imagery, dance, and voice in drawing attention to and shaping African, identi African, African urban identities, cultures, lifestyles, aspirations, and urban environments? Who are the influences who can shape these new movements for African urban sustainability? How can we create how can creative expression and narrative be used as the basis for city and community building? How can storytelling complement the scientific approaches for sustaining urban development? Amid myriad negative urban motifs of African cities, this session tangles with the questions, the questions of representation, participation, and voice in defining African urban narratives and draws out how celebration can be a valuable approach to reclaiming visions of African cities. The session highlights voices from the creative sphere and how they 
how they can or are contributing to shaping and owning the urban African narratives using media, using literature, using photography and artistic expression as we just saw from um, Frequency. Frequency, when you talked about the rooster and the mispronounced country, sis, I was about to say, uh, which street in my village are you from? My name is Bata Gilisite and I am joining you from Khaburune Botswana. I have the honor and privilege of facilitating this session. Good morning, good afternoon, if you happen to be joining us always already afternoon and thank you so much to the audience for joining us. Um, as Africans, art has always been very important to us and it's always, and it's reflected in this year's Africa Day theme, arts, culture and heritage, levers for building the Africa we want. Afri art for us as Africans has been expression, it's been communication, it's been religion, it's been celebration, and it's been play, it's been royalty. It's taken every form that there is to take. And for today's session, we unpack that. In the session, shaping and owning African urban narratives through literature, art, and movement building. And I am joined by brilliant African minds. Um, first, I'm joined by Gugu Nonjinge. She is an external communications and advocacy professional with extensive experience in the social policy sector. She's currently a senior advocate officer at the Center for Study and Violence and Reco Study of Violence and Reconciliation. Her areas of interest are gender justice and climate justice. And as an NDP 2030 ambassador, her personal work through her foundation is focused on the holistic development of the African, African girl child and active, inclus active inclusion of the youth demographic at all levels of governance. She has, she has been recognized by the British High Commission in South Africa as a woman leading on climate change activism ahead of COP26. Google has also received awards such as the Social Cohesion and Civil Society Main Award by the National Youth Development Agency and recognition as Masisulu Woman of Fortitude by the Department of Energy for her work on gender justice. Gugu, such a pleasure to be sitting on the same panel with you. Um, and op any opening words? No, thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to the engagements today um, and further learning from other panelists and some of the questions that will come through uh, throughout the session. Thank you. Thank you, Gugu. Um, I just remembered now because our next uh, speaker, her name is Sotswana. Her name is Sotswana. And I remembered as you were all being welcomed, you weren't welcomed, Gasotswana. So I will welcome you, Gasotswana, and say, Rala Mohela. Ritumela Horabeleha. Our next speaker is Lesero Banting, um, a candidate landscape artic ar architect and aspiring urban designer. She's the founder of, she's the co-founder of Uhuru Heritage, an MPO geared at molding current and future societies. When she's not designing, Lesejo is a part-time lecturer at the University of Cape Town, contributing to the course Landscape Representation. In 2019, she was one of the top 10 house and leisure next generation creators after receiving the Korobrick Most Innovative Award for her thesis titled Ula Aene, Occupying Land in Restorated, Restorated, restituted Barolong homelands. In the short amount of time Lesera has been involved in the built industry, her contribution to the broad, broad uh, has been to broaden the scope of landscape ag agriculture, architecture. This architecture word just keeps dribbling me in South Africa. Um, Lesera holds a master's of landscape architecture from University of UCT and the BSc in landscape architecture from the University of Pretoria. Lissero is generally a creative, um, a creative urban photographer and sculptor who constantly contributes to the collective memory of the African experience. Any opening words? No, and um, thank you so much for pronouncing my name correctly and your introduction. I'm just excited to engage with everybody and, and learn, like Gugu said, from each and every one of the people on this panel. 
Thank you. Um, and then last but definitely not least, um, Mwende Frequency Kashiwa, who opened the session for us with that beautiful, po with that beautiful um, poem. She is a storyteller, a speaker, a workshop leader and performance artist. She is also a gender renegade and Shonga Kenyan migrant who self-identifies as a masculine off-center femme adjacent, an auntie and a pretty boy. Uh, Frequencies work interrogates and occupies the spaces between um, gender and geography while exploring the mundane nuances and stark contradictions of everyday existence. This humanoid has been featured in or written for the Independent, the New York Times, OK Africa, Upworthy, TEDx for Harriet, Teen Vogue, Huffington, Everyday Feminism, and other outlets, and has a TED Talk with nearly 1 million views that I highly recommend you go and see. Uh, Frequency, excited to have you here. Any opening words? Oh, again, just gratitude for the invitation and excitement for the conversation to come. Right. So in kicking off um, the conversation, you're all from different fields. Within your respective field and area of expertise, what would you say, um, would you say there's a presence of African urban narratives at present? Um, so we'll go Gugu and then Lesora and then Frequency. Okay, can you please repeat your question? So the question was, um, within your respective field mm. or area of expertise, would you say there is a presence of African urban narratives? Um, so I work in the social justice uh, sort of space, social policy space, and my work mostly focuses on has a broad uh, has a broad uh, uh, lens on, on on gender and youth. And I think there is quite currently present, or let me just say recently, there has been that narrative sort of coming through in the, in the work that we're doing, right? Especially uh, when it comes to representation of young people in, in, in the work and in, in ensuring that um, their voices are being recognized and ensuring that they're meaningfully uh, in, included in, in decision-making structures. So there has been um, a rise in, 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 the, in the inclusion of that narrative in that sense. So I think it also depends on the type of work within the sector that you're also doing, but uh, championing a, 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 an intersectional um, approach in, all, in, in, in the work in this field has sort of opened that, that, that door of recognizing urban narratives and ensuring that young people from all, from, all, from different, um, from respective uh, backgrounds are recognized and are included in these discussions. Um, great to see that there's a rise in inclusion in your area. Um, Lesseron? Um, so I work in the both environment planning sphere, and for a long time, there wasn't an inclusion of African narratives. I think that now I see a lot of young people seeking that and asking for that, but there it's quite a tough thing because it's it feels to some degree like a superimposition. It feels like, like an imposter syndrome kind of a situation. Sort of in my in my studies, the basis of architectural design is a uh, Western lens. And the time that you get to learn about African narratives, African societies is like 10% of, of the whole thing. And even when you do go that route, there are not a lot of people to guide you along the way. And so it's become very important for um, the, the young generation, the few of us young Africans that are coming into this field to sort of create this archive. And I see a lot of that happening. There are a lot of um, groups of young Africans that are trying to consolidate information and make it available to the next generation of young people that are coming in so they can know that those stories, those theses, that kind of thinking exists. But in the institution itself, it, it is not there. And it's something that um, I myself am working towards. Um, thank you. 
Thanks, Lissahol. You know, with that response, um, I remember something that I tweeted last week was, can we please get more African voices talking um, about some of these things? And it's great that the younger generation, the Gen Zs, this whole thing of imposter syndrome, they're just like, how about that? Nah? So um, glad to see we're on the same page and we're working towards changing it. Frequency? Yes, I think I was first trying to determine what my field is in particular that I have expertise in. So I'll, I'll speak to the um, field of storytelling um, and specifically to the work that Paza Saudi is doing in Kenya. Um, we were we were started as a direct intervention in the space because when I first began doing poetry back home in Nairobi, there was a lot of artists who would come to me and say, particularly women artists or queer artists or artists who were outside of the, the traditional narrative of who's voice gets told when African narratives are being told in the rare instance that they're being told. And so we began to create a container that would expand what we even mean when we say African, uh, what it is that comes to people's minds. And I think one of the things that um, we notice as somebody who, who spends time both in Nairobi and in the United States is that globally there is an emergence now of a, of a new generation of African narratives. But I think when I'm in the States, I sometimes wonder who it is that they're speaking to and who the audience is. I think a lot about who gets access to the narratives based on the languages that they're put together, based on the technological platforms that they get to get put out. Um, and I think about how a lot of what is, again, still accepted as African narratives is, is told it's African by external um, audiences as opposed to internal African audiences when you're looking at the global stage. So I think for sure there's been an emergence in the last decade, um, a new renaissance of like African literature and writing and but sometimes I wonder um, yeah, what that actually looks like when I go back to Kenya and I'm trying to talk to you know everyday Kenyans about some of these people who might have an international following or platform, but can people actually back home be able to even access your books because your publisher was in like the UK or something? Um, what you're saying frequency actually leads into the next question that I wanted to ask. Um, we're cognizant that we're in a global village and the lines between tribes, nations and continents in terms of narratives have become a bit blurred. What we're seeing in Japan is what we're seeing in Honduras, is what we're seeing in Botswana, is what we're seeing in Kenya, at least a certain aspect of it. Um, we're all listening to Justin Bieber's latest album. We were all listening to Jerusalem. Um, and most of them are quite mainstream, which then begs the question of, is it necessary to brand ourselves as African narratives, when going more mainstream seems to be the order of the day and what is consumed, where African narratives seem to be niche, are we perhaps not limiting our reach um, as Africans from us reaching the globe? The frequency, I'll start with you because I see you nodding and then we'll go Lesseha and Google. Uh, I work with young people often and a lot of young writers will come to me, particularly in the States, and, and wonder, is my writing Black enough? And I tell them, well, are you Black? And they're like, yeah. Then I'm like, what you're writing then is Black because it is coming from you. There is no inherent container for Blackness. And it are actually responsible if you cannot find a place in it to expand that container so that other people can also find their place within it. And I think it's the same um, when we're talking about uh, African narratives, it's that it's it's up to us as people to again define what it is that African is Africanness is at the same time not allowing those definitions to become prescriptive or to become limiting to what Africanness has always been as well. Because I think the recognition when we're talking about expanding narratives makes us think as if we're starting from something that is small that needs to be expanded, as opposed to something that the, the lens that we use to look at it is small, but it's actually always been very abundant and always been very versatile and variable in the ways that we show up. And so this is where the, the telling stories becomes important because history is, is, is just a collection of stories, right? It's the collection of whose stories have been elevated to believability and legitimacy by the, the outside world. And for so long, even no matter what, if you were African, no matter what intersection of identity you were at, your story did not matter, right? And then once it became um, 
once African narratives started being accepted into a more global sphere, once Africans started being considered, you know, human and things like that, um, then we started to fall also into the pitfalls of how people define humanity. So now when we're talking about African narratives, we're still looking at an external definition of humanity that excluded women, that excluded queer people, that excluded poor people, that excluded villagers, that excluded all of these different narratives. So again, it's not that Africanness is this small, small thing. Africanness has always been wide and expansive, and it's our job to bring it back to what it has always been by continuing to tell our stories and show the diversity of it by our existences. Um, thank you for that. Lisa Hall, Gugu? Yeah, I completely agree with what Frequency has said. I, I resonate with it. I, I think that if you are black and if you identify as African, the work that you do should immediately identify as that as well. I think that for me, the importance of African narratives comes from, like she said, um, um, the, 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 the historical exclusion of the stories, right? The, the, the exclusion from just cosmology or being or ontology, just the fact that even now, as we try to occupy a space within um, ideas, global ideas, it's still um, sidelined, it's still boxed, it's not um, adding to theories of life or theories of being. And so by diversifying um, global perspectives um, on just being, you can also, it just automatically speaks on or includes um, a lot of African narratives. Um, I think that for me, I, I just, learned a lot from doing my thesis around villages and seeing how um, for a long time, even as we use a lot of the words urban, um, a lot of rural ideas on urbanism are excluded because it is not described as a city or an urban context, but in itself has a lot of urban context or a lot of um, ideas or principles that are relevant to urban living and city forming. And so even by that kind of terminology or separating things and saying urban and rural um, or um, city or and village, it kind of marginalizes important ideas about just being and cities. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I'm very interested in uh, African narratives being seen as a part of an integral part of society in the world, as opposed to being sidelined or put in a category in the box as African or indigenous knowledge systems, but rather as just knowledge. I hope that answers. Oh, um, I also agree with with the with the with the two speakers that have spoken, and, and I think. More than anything in us uh, sort of uh, amplifying our African narratives and sort of championing our African narratives, we also need not to, 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 to ignore the collaboration part of it, because I believe that collaboration that sort of uh, honors cultural identity and sort of creative expression is a, is a, is a very particularly um, um, effective strategy. Uh, to build bonds, not just in, in within our communities or within our country, but also to build bonds and bridges between people and humanity as a, as a whole, and also between groups. Uh, and I believe it, it, it is a very key element when it comes to social cohesion and and sort of championing a very a, a, a very uh, a very strong bonds between humanity and between people, uh, and just not just in Africa alone. And it, that has, over the years, have shown to, to, to impact survival in, 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 in quite a lot of um, context, country context as well. And I'll also say to the, to the point you were saying in the introduction, this isn't just something that we're seeing on the African continent. We, you can look at what's happening in South Africa as the same as what's happening in Ecuador, it's the same as what's happening in New Orleans, because at the end of the day, what we're all speaking to is the greater narrative of racialized capitalism and how we have survived it as melanated oppressed people. And that story, while the details might differ in the different geographic areas, a lot of it is the same, right? It's, it's about resistance, it's about trying to reclaim, like was just said, our humanity in a container that has told us you are unhuman. And that's a global struggle, like I'm saying, for melanated people, not just an African struggle. And part of the, uh, the way that we are kept, you know, I think a lot about this generation and what this generation's Pan-Africanism is going to look like because we are connected to one another in a way that we have never been connected before. And it's allowing us to realize that so many of the stories that 
are deeply personal and individualized to our context are actually not that personal or unique at all. Again, we have just been kept from the connections that have allowed us to realize that this is not something new. It's not something that's even unique to you, even though it feels deeply personal. Um, and that connectivity that happens, I think, is what starts to threaten this, this structure that's around us that feels so immovable, but is actually already on shaky grounds. Um, definitely. I think that we can see across just the responses, um, all of our different backgrounds, all of us are from, well, four different, well, not really, you guys are both in South Africa, but well, from different countries um, on the continent. And uh, Jean Fall has just joined us, the thorn among the roses. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm going to, I'm going to um, bring you into the conversation just now. Um, my next question is more for the creators on the panel, um, including you, Lesoho, um, from the architectural side. How can we engage creative expression and narrative to feed into city and community building? We all know that our cities are growing, and as our cities are growing, there's almost, it's as if our communities are shrinking or they're now growing in a different manner. How can we engage creative expression as to supplement that? Um, so we'll go Le Serro and then um, Frequency and then um, Jean, because he's, maybe you're still settling in. Okay, um, I think first we need to understand that creative expression and narrative are integral to development and urban, urban formations. They, they are not, they are intertwined. Um, I think usually case becomes whose narrative and whose story. Most of the time, it's not diverse enough. Most of the time, it's not inclusive enough. Um, most of the time, it's less people than required who are sharing their narratives and, and, and contributing to a creative story for a project. And so although we've seen that a lot of institutions and organizations and our governments have tried to do um, community, participate, community participation projects in order to include and diversify narratives, oftentimes um, I find that when there's somebody else coming into a space, there's an overall agenda or an overall motive um, that can sometimes sort of limit the creativity or narrative that can come from communities shaping their own spaces. And so for me, what has become important has been to empower communities to conceptualize their own projects in their own cities without having to compromise that for a bigger agenda or somebody else's agenda. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's diversity that is quite integral. And also knowing that in speaking about issues that affect black people, you have to speak about the plethora of issues. You have to speak about the exclusion of queer bodies. You have to speak about the exclusion of women. And so you cannot solve just one issue. I think we've seen it with um, the call or oh, a fight against race, racial injustice is that um, if you do not change the whole thing, the exclusion of marginalized people in general, um, it won't be enough. And a lot of projects just sort of try it the one step, but you realize in a year's time, that very same project was exclusionary nature because it didn't consider the whole thing. And so, um, yeah, if we understand that creativity is an integral part of everything, it just matters whose creation, whose ideas and whose arts we're including. Because I mean, I say this maybe easily or casually as a designer, because the first step of every design process for myself includes that. And the first step of most kind of development projects includes some sort of creativity, but the importance is that I'm not engaging only my own and that I'm diversifying the voices that I'm including in conceptualizing projects. Um, to help or empower communities. Um, thanks, Mr. Ho. Before you come in uh, frequency, may I just invite um, our attendees, if there's anything you'd like to comment on, if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A um, Q box and we shall ask them towards the end of the session. Please make sure that you put them in the Q&A because our chat is quite busy. So if you put it in the chat instead of the Q&A, we might miss it. Frequency, over to you. Yeah, um, I think one of the things I was trying to capture in the opening poem for this session is the idea 
that, that, that I've come to understand that, you know, our people are, we are works of art. You know, some of us are poems, some of us are songs, some of us are these different things. Um, but somehow in the, in the world that we we're living in, again, racialized capitalism, this very product oriented sort of thing, the idea of an artist in creation has been just removed from humanity, right? It's like an artist is now a job or it's a title or something as opposed to like a way to move through the world or just a way to engage with the things that are around you. So I think the creative expression feeds into um, the development of, of countries of people in, in the sense that all of us have something to offer um, as artists, even if we do not identify ourselves as artists, we are all engaging in creation processes often, right? I think about uh, some of the most talented artists I know are people who are chefs or cooks or something. And they spend, it's like artistry when they're in the kitchen. I can't do it like them, right? But when they see a notebook or something, they can't quite do it the same way as I can. And that's fine to be able to, um, engage in art in different ways, but also be able to value art and value those contributions in the same sorts of way. So there's there's some arts I think that have been elevated, um, particularly aesthetic art that we say like, wow, that is fine art. This is what is the representation of art. But when you look at what does it actually translate and trickle down to for the community, it rarely does. Um, and I also think that it's, it's important to one of the things that I struggled with in my 20s was being invited to spaces because I was a thinker uh, but showing up in spaces as an artist, right? And being like, there's no such, there's no way for me to divorce the two. And in fact, I think you all actually need an artist here more than you need a thinker because an artist, artists are the few people in this world that are socialized to retain our imagination and retain creativity as like a, a place of excitement. And there's a, a relationship between creativity and the creation of things, whether they're art or not, that I think we don't talk enough about. And so I was reading this article today um, by the founder, the, this founder of this organization called the NAP Ministry, which is just encouraging Black people around the world to take naps as a form of resistance. And she was saying that um, she tells people like, just take a 15 minute break uh, and take a nap during your work day. And people are like, oh my God, I can't imagine doing that. And she's like, you see right there? How are you gonna imagine the end of policing if you can't even imagine 15 minutes in your day to take a nap? Imagination is a skill that we need to practice over and over again until it gets to a scale that we can imp implement world change and not fear it um, and not fear the trying that has to happen also. Um, thanks for that frequency. Napping as resistance, sign me up. Um, I'm gonna be there for the next session. Uh, Jean, please come in. Hello everyone, and uh, sorry for being late. I had a, an external meeting, uh, drink uh, more longer. And sorry for my English because uh, I'm French native, so I might do some mistakes. Um, so I'm uh, very happy to be here. Thank you uh, for inviting me to Rise Africa and uh, for ECLE for what you're doing. I think it's very important to have this space to discuss this subject. Uh, we don't have this kind of, of discussions in the Francophone area. Uh, I can only uh, uh, be sad of, about that because uh, we're mainly focusing usually on the economic part or business part, but talking about this subject uh, of the creativity, uh, the deep link between the way we are creating things and the way we are expressing things uh, out on the outside world and showing what is Africanness, what is African culture. I think we don't have this, these discussions enough and uh, as the founder of Cinewax, um, I've been building this kind of imaginary around Africa and, and what Africa is, but I'm not, I'm not building it myself. I, I'm using the artists themselves, the artists work with their films. Um, and just to kind of explain to everybody, uh, we started by making festivals and events in 2015. And uh, years after years, we, we noticed that doing film house events in France only was not the only way to touch people and to, to show them what Africa was. And we decided to go digital and we created the first online African film festival uh, that started in 2018. And now in 2020, we created our own streaming platform called the same OIFF platform, Cinox platform. And we're trying to show African narratives uh, through this platform, uh, various narratives from North to South, also narratives from the diaspora and what um, shocked me when I started to do that, it was the only movie that was available for the average audience, might be French, might be even African, 
um, at least in France and in Europe, was only stories about villages or stories about migration. Uh, uh, we, we call that um, NGO movies, you know, when they do a movie to support a theme. And it's quite embarrassing because as an, an African myself, uh, my, my, my father is Senegalese, my mother is French. I, I, I went there, I went in Senegal and in some countries and I know what's, what's there. I know what's happening. I know people are living different lives that we're not telling thousands of stories that are not be t being told. And we just get a glimpse of that. And often it's not the right angle. I mean, that's my perspective. And throughout my work, I discovered first different perspective, but also visions. I think I can relate totally to what you were saying uh, less ago and, and frequently I think of, about the, the way we should, we portray ourselves as a community, as a global African community, and also as, as individual artists and thinkers. Um, I can relate to the work of um, Wani Rikaiwe uh, when she did Rafiki. You know, it's not just a story about uh, queer people in Kenya. You know, it's about love. It's how do you tell a story about love in Africa and Kenya in this specific context and what they are facing in their lives. And it's a universal subject because they are submitted to pressure. Uh, the society is pursuing them. They, they don't want them to, to express their love. And how do they react to that? And I think coming from cinema is important because we always talk about universality. Uh, cinema is universal. But what kind of cinema is universal? I really want to ask this question. Ask yourself what cinemas are being shown in the biggest festivals and you will understand now the notion of, of universality is not, uh, is biased. So yeah, uh, that was my introduction. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, on your point of the NGO movies, I think those are right up there with um, what we commonly call poverty porn, um, th that genre of movies. Gugu, would you like to come in? Yeah, I actually wanted to, to say something on the on the building of, of I mean, uh, using um, creative expressions on the on the basis for, for building cities and communities and then and I think that one thing that's sort of missing in the discussion is that we're not these should not just be used as just building the cities but also I personally believe that creative expression is very fundamental to building resilient communities and that should be the aim right across right uh, and by this I mean from 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 in, in income inequality unemployment to poverty education poor health care communities around the world and not just Africa alone are facing these critical challenges. And, and they require quite a lot of creative ideas and solutions. I myself, I'm not a creative, but I believe that any of these problems and any of these challenges could use creative expression. And in us building um, uh, not just cities and communities, but making sure that they are resilient, especially in the current environmental crisis, uh, is that culture and creativity, we need to underscore or rather assert that they are powerful tools for our communities to sort of uh, create a positive narrative about who they are, first of all, uh, and what is it that they need and what, what do their future sort of look like. So more than anything, it isn't just about the building, but also making sure that it is resilient communities and forward-looking communities as well. I also think about the ways that creativity has, has been a form of resistance or has helped sustain resistance in the previous generation. I don't think any of us probably grew up in a household where someone wasn't singing or humming in some way. Um, and that, you know, it wasn't until I got into my 20s that I was like, huh, I think there was there was some sort of healing element that happens too when you relate and connect to art in a way that has nothing again to do with the product or the outcome but has to do with the connectivity because art is also about feeling and we especially as black people as african people around the world we are so socialized to not be in tune with our feelings because we are constantly doing we are constantly maintaining we are constantly surviving so i think art too is an invitation back into our own humanity into the fullness of our feelings into being able to express them um, and not fear the expression of them. So it is both a, a way to engage in a healing modality while also um, you know, engaging in, in the healing of the past while also engaging in the creation of a future where you do not need to heal so much from things and you do not need to be as resilient as we have been in order to survive up until this point. Um, sorry, <laughs> um, I definitely agree. Um, 
I also think that like we, we also need to sort of be. I, I was once in a, in a in a training in Sudan where um, where art is used as a form of, of of trauma healing, and and one thing that I sort sort of took away from that experience is how artists can sort of illuminate truth uh, um, and also sort of offer some transcendent experience in a world that is far too literal and also making sure and making sure that they it challenge it, the art that they produce or the art that they create sort of challenges our communities to sort of feel so. Uh, as, as I'm saying, I sort of agree with you. And also more than anything, connecting uh, our communities and, and, and our cities to, to, our, to our common humanity, and that, which is something that sort of has been missing in this century, the connection aspect of it. Yes, and I was, I was going to say, um, I forgot to say, oh, sorry. Can I come in here? Um, because we need to also leave space for our lovely um, um, audience at the end for their Q and A. Um, I'm going to ask one question and then with it, please also, if you can list, that would be great. Um, and then we're going to hand it over to our audience because quite a number of people, um, there's some people who are sharing questions um, in the Q&A. And the question before um, we hand it back is, a lot of our sustainable urban development solutions are driven by the science. This anchors off of the comment that Google made on resilience. Um, usually, I... I, I uh, associate resilience with um, being resilient against climate change and just uh, against a lot of things. But a lot of our solutions are rooted in science. Um, how may we marry scientific approaches and arts such as storytelling to diversify the knowledge methods, um, to, to diversify the knowledge methods? Um, and how can we capitalize off of the relationship of the two? How can the two engage? I see that on the call, we've got PhD, um, PhD holders, we've got experts um, in different um, industries, and I'm sure that they're going to want to, ha um, to have something that they can take forward to their work um, and their next project. How can we marry art and science to amplify um, change, basically, and to amplify impact? Um, I'll start with Gugu, and then Jean, and Le Serro in Frequency. Guys, you need to keep it really small. I'm going to be strict with you no. now. <laughs> Give me three points. Um, love how you just say, as I'm thinking, like, I'll start with Gugu, and I'm just like, ah, okay, cool, <laughs> let's go. Um, I think more than anything, currently, um, science is has sort of, we've been operating in this narrative where science has been creating, um, or rather science has been developing, um, strategies and 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 the other English word that's sort of run out of my mind right now for our African countries and for African cities. However, right now what we need to sort of look into is using a, a sort of a bottom-up approach that sort of enables our local residents and our community members to define and shape their own future and not just receive solutions from science, right? And, and, by, and, and also this sort of seeks to, to, to generate information about local needs. What is it that Africans need? What is it that our communities need? And what is it that are in, individually um, based on, 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 on the community assets that we sort of have in Africa, or rather the, the, the generic, I mean, general um, assets that our continent sort of has. And I believe that by generating this information through, we can generate this information through storytelling um, about our various contexts, various countries, various um, uh, neighborhoods based on, on resources and capabilities about, the, about our current uh, and future demand. What is it that we seek and what is it that works for Africa? And I think that this sort of does, uh, these, this sort of initiative sort of can be launched and meet identified needs within our countries, within the continent at large, and also can advance long-term sustainability. So more than anything, it is not about receiving um, strategies from science, but making sure that it is a bottom-up approach that engages our local residents. Um, thanks for that. Um, frequency, um, if there's a link where we can get your opening poem, please post it in the chat. There is a request for it. Um, Jean? Yeah. One minute. Yeah, wow. Okay. Uh, I can totally relate. I think my, my approach of, of science is uh, technical, technicity. Uh, we live in a world now that has been, is being shaped by science because of the, the crisis. So everything that will come down after that will be linked to uh, critical 
medical issues or scientific approach because it's how it, it's being ruled right now. However, human beings doesn't work like that, don't work like that. We, we are emotional beings and, and we need more than just technical approach to rule our lives. And also, if we want science to help humans, we need to understand how emotionally we think and how do we, can we pass a message to us uh, in order to improve the community, improve change. So no relating to cinema. Cinema is perfect, I would say, one of the, 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 beautiful, the most beautiful things that links arts and science because cinema is technical. The lens, uh, the way you create the movie, the, everything is technical in, in cinema. And yet you have to, to make a beautiful movie, you need emotions, you need heart. You need something which is deep into our soul, into our mind. And so basically what, can, what cinema can bring to science and scientific approach and to bring change, I think is just to have a different perspective uh, to help maybe scientists to improve the ways they work or just to give them ideas of what could be, what could be the possible. And it relates to what Google was saying about, it's more about creating uh, the, 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 the sensation or the dream of people. I think it's very important that Africans and, and, and people from the diaspora all over the world can reclaim uh, their own narratives and, and, and their, their own emotions. Very important. Yeah, that's my point. Um, that's a running theme, uh, reclaiming our narratives. So Lesoho, you are the special child in class. You're, um, you're loved more than everyone. You've got your own question dedicated to you in the Q&A. Um, how do you propose that the upcoming generation of landscape architects and other built environment professionals use their skills to empower communities of Africa and express African narratives. That's from Sandra. Thank you for that question, Sandra. Did you get that, Lesero? Yes, I did. But Pato, can I also weigh in on the previous question conversation? And then I can answer Sandra Sandra's question as well. Do you have time for that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. One yeah. minute. Okay. okay. So um I, I think that there was a time when art and science were intertwined and indistinguishable. Um, I think to some degree we have forgotten that now. Um, when I think about um, my heritage as a Botswana, there were a lot of um, taboos or stories that were told um, that were scientific in nature. I think about um, the stories we heard about staying away from the river or the, the Kopi and how those two areas are very environmentally sensitive and by not encroaching development to those kinds of areas is environmental science in nature. I also think about totem animals. Um, my totem is the kudu as morolong and how if you had a totem animal assigned to your tribe, your tribe wasn't allowed to hunt that animal and how that is also a management system um, of, 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 of animals in, in a kind of way. And so, I also think about the story of Isaac Newton and how an apple fell on his head and that's how he discovered gravity and thinking of that story as something that makes gravity accessible. I, 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 I think about all the other African stories that I heard growing up and how those make science accessible. Um, I mean, if we all had to be physicians and understand gravity the way truly is understood by science, it wouldn't be so accessible, but through stories, through art, um, and through music, we can understand complex ideas and complex kind of things in a more accessible way. And also they can be embedded in our day to day and embedded in our society and accessible. Um, now to Sandra's question, how can we contribute? I mean, there's a lot of ways that spatial practitioners can contribute to building communities, I think, Google spoke about a bottom up approach and most of the time we want to be architects and come to a community and save it. But I think by just engaging with communities and their own expression, I think if we, if we do projects that help communities realize who they are and that they are valuable and that their creativity and their artworks and their thinking around themselves is valid and that as we come in as spatial practitioners, it is not to um, give them a broader solution by, but rather give access to specific resources or um, skills that they might not have to make their own dream of themselves come true, then we would have contributed in a much more conducive way than how it's happening now. Yeah. 
um, a thank you for that, Lissero. One last one for you. Um, earlier, you spoke on how the design, um, how the landscape um, is Eurocentric. Um, what have we done about it so far? Which projects are we pushing um, for a more African view of design? I think, Jean, you touched on that earlier when you talked of um, telling more African um, voice um, stories frequency. You also spoke about that when you touched on if you're telling it, it's, if you're telling it as an African, it's your African story, it's your African narrative. But Lesejo, you, um, they're asking specifically about landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my approach has been to actually steer a little bit away from urban and city and go towards rural. And this is not to not come back and look at the city again, but by understanding a lot of what happens in rural spaces, those ideologies and cosmologies, I've, I think that there's a way that we can view informality in our cities, you know, the, the things that we regard as like periphery and marginalized sort of elements of our city, if we understand rural spaces better, then we can start to form an opinion about informality. And so the way in which that I've tried to include stories is by understanding um, where we come from. So South Africa, um, the way it's been planned, especially due to apartheid, has been to sort of marginalize um, homeland areas um, in planning, and then we get a lot of, even in development, and we get a lot of people moving then from rural areas into the city. The city from its formation has never included the African. And so the biggest source of the Africanness in the South African context, context for me has been a rural space. And by understanding that, I've been able to understand what a city might look like, an African city might look like, or I have been able to reimagine what urban living looks like for um, an African or Black person is by going to this route or this place that has been so marginalized but holds so much heritage. I mean, we have um, heritage organizations in South Africa that preserve buildings that are older than 60 years, but our villages, they have huts and things that are older than 60 years, and those are not prioritized at all. Um, they are just seen as homelands, just left to, to whoever is meant to plan it. And a lot of those, those buildings, those huts are going away. I went home the past weekend and um, the rainstorm just damaged so many huts because nobody's doing the work to preserve them. Nobody thinks that they're valuable heritage. Nobody thinks they're important. And so it has been my work with Uhuru to prioritize those and say, that is a valuable building. That is heritage, that is architecture. It is not prehistory. It is not point zero type of work. It is, it is, it is valuable and it can contribute to contemporary uh, thank you, Lusoho. Also thought-provoking um, question there by Frequency. And she says, what is a city? Who was it meant for originally? And how does this impact their legacies today? Um, I don't understand where the last hour went. We only have two minutes left. Um, and in the spirit of celebrating Africa Day, I'm going to ask a question. You each have 20 seconds. 20 seconds. I'll be timing you. Um, and the last question is, celebration across African cultures has always been a big thing. It brought together people, it brought together families, it's brought us together now to celebrate Africa Day and have this conversation. How may we weave the value of celebration into claiming and cementing our visions for African cities and urban narratives? 20 seconds. Google Frequency Le Serrant Jean. That's how you show up on. Okay, Google for once. Um, I, I won't start with you. <laughs> okay, Frequency Jean Le Serrant Google. 20 seconds. Well, now it's 15 seconds because Google wanted to negotiate. I'm horrible as a first person because I always forget the question immediately. So I'm sorry to be the first one and uh, I, I really can't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> how can we weave the value of celebration into claiming and cementing oh. visions of African cities? I think it, it's important to celebrate the steps along the way. Uh, we're socialized in this world again of production to be like, I need to start and then tomorrow needs to be this perfectly finished thing. And if I fail along the way, it's all been a failure. And it's like, no, celebrate every small thing along the way and also celebrate the fact that you're just here every day because there's a lot of people who don't wake up to continue the work that they started the day before. Let me go with 
let me go without wasting time. Sorry, Miss okay. Echo. <laughs> Um, I'll be quick. But I think for me in the celebration, that also we need, I think we need to be very authentic and be, and be very real. When there is things to celebrate, then, then sure. But if there isn't, then we need to be very vocal about it, right? I, I, I said something to a friend today that there's every part, there isn't anything inside me today that says I should celebrate Africa Day. And that's that that's okay for me because I know what what has has been happening across the continent, the the role that our governments have been playing in in in, in everything, including human rights violations in our continent. So within me, there isn't an inch of me that wants to celebrate and recognize Africa Day. And I think in the celebration, we need to be authentic, we need to be real, and we need to recognize what is wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I appreciate that we sort of um, understood then the role of celebrations as an act. I want to speak of celebrations as an event. Um, a lot of the time I've seen that celebrations are sort of like a, a mini city, a mini society. They are, they are embedded with a lot of rituals, traditions that are passed on. And so it is quite important to, when you're within that space to observe all the nuances because they are really a reflection of broader society. I mean, if if you have like a classist sort of, you will see that at event VIP areas, you will, you will see those kinds of things. They are a reflection of our society. So I think they are important in seeing and being able to then say, leaving that space, what can you change? You can see it at a smaller scale and then at a broader scale when you leave that space, sort of what can be improved in the, in the bigger celebration of life. It's, that's living life, yeah. Thank you. Well, now you have four seconds. You make the most of it. <laughs> I, I, I have very few things to add. Uh, I totally relate to what's being said. Uh, I want to say, uh, I'm thinking about as an event, we celebrate Africa Day, but I think we should be focusing on celebrating Africa Days, celebrating Africa every day, or you know, focusing on different aspects of Africa, and as a city, I think it's important that we kind of have this, this focus of cultural event on specific cities so we know better these cities. And, and I think um, I'm just thinking about like uh, the Chinese uh, um, yearly uh, party, you know, to celebrate the Chinese culture. I think we should have that in, in, in every city in Africa to have this uh, Lagos party, uh, Lagos Day, uh, Dakar Day, and, and you know, it would help us relate more to different cultures and the, the broader uh, African culture uh, throughout the world. And th thank you so much. Lagos Day, sign me up. Have you been to a Nigerian party? Um, to the panel, Gugu, uh, Frequency, Le Serangeon, thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed the conversation. Would have liked for it um, to go on a bit longer. Um, may you please all share maybe your social media handles and how people can get in touch with you in the in the chat. I've seen that some people would like to get in touch with you. And in closing, we say um, happy Africa Day. Celebrate the fact that you are here. Celebrate authentically. Celebrate um, consciously and celebrate every day. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Bhatta Gilisite. It has been a pleasure hosting you for the session. Ah, well, 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 well. Um, what is then left? Hmm, what, is, what is left? We, ha we are celebrating. And, um, you know, I, 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 I captured a few things from the panel as they talked. I remember some things uh, someone said, artists appeal to the imagination and creativity. I am an aspiring one. Every day I aspire to be an artist, but... Uh, I think the skills are quite lacking on my side. Well, thank you, uh, Pato, for um, moderating that wonderful um, panel. And thank you, our panelists, for you know enriching our understanding and expanding our appreciation of art in building um, resilient cities, in building Afro-centered cities in building, I don't know, the English uh, words may, uh, I may run short of the English words. Hey, we are now going in to see, to see. So we've been listening, we've been hearing. Now we are going to see what is there that people have done with their hands um, with um, in terms of art, 
and indeed the session is titled Portraits of Our African Cities, Urban Development Reflections Through Art. We have three people um, who are going to take us through this wonderful session. And here we go. I take the pleasure now to introduce um, our exhibitors, if you want, Shafiq, uh, an artist, an architect, that is, uh, uh, that, that is a word that challenges me, and co-founder, Urban Sketchers Liberia. Shafiq, uh, can you show up, please? Hey, all right. I think Shafiq is there. I saw Shafiq. And the other one, the other one is uh, none other than Arthur Adair, also architect, principal partner, and, uh, and a co-founder. I'm sorry, the uh, video was blocked from your side. Okay, there comes Shafiq. Thank you very much. And um, I'm also joined here, sorry, by uh, artist uh, Sano. Yeah, this is artist Sano. Sano, you are most welcome. And Thank we are you. going to give you an opportunity to shine. Um, let me also, let me also invite uh, the other one to just show up and then uh, we will continue with you, Shavik. And the other mm. is Arthur. Arthur, are you there? Can you please show up? Arthur Adair. Yes, I am. I think it should be on. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Arthur. So, and then later on, we will be joined by another one called Bethwell Mangena, who is uh, an artist, a cartoon artist. And talking about cartoon artists, we, in, throughout the, uh, the, the event, the Africa, the Rise Africa event, we'll be having some cartoon artists doing some work, uh, hands-on work. Hi, Bethwell, uh, you'll have some time also to talk. Now, may I indulge you in art by inviting, I see that, uh, uh, yeah, Arthur, are you ready? Shall, we'll start with you, Arthur, and then we'll move over to Shafiq uh, together with uh, a friend there. Um, yes, Arthur? Okay. Uh, I think uh, yes, thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, thank you very much, Rise Africa. Uh, appreciate being here. Uh, very interesting conversations going on. I will share my screen. Uh, I hope. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen now. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I received this invitation uh, from Rise Africa, and specifically Kevin Mutier, who uh, happens to be my student uh, several years back. So I am extremely impressed and uh, very happy. Uh, that uh, our students, uh, my former students, are now uh, leading the charge towards driving uh, uh, urban thinking uh, in Africa. So I was just going to share a few sketches uh, that I have done and uh, maybe just give a little bit of a narrative as to why I sketch, how I sketch, uh, and what happens uh, when I sketch. Uh, and I mean, the, the current theme and current talking about uh, cities and urban resilience uh, and how sketching uh, for me uh, offers that. I actually have a couple of day jobs, as you've heard. I, I, I lecture at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. I also work for a developer um, called Centum Real Estate, where I drive their uh, project management uh, and planning implementation. And so every now and then when I sketch, people wonder, so what's going on? Uh, my thoughts behind sketching uh, really come from a combination of something I think uh, the American writer James Baldwin uh, wrote, and I 
think I might be paraphrasing it a little bit. Uh, maybe I picked it up also from Chiniwa Achebe's book, uh, The Education of a British Protected Citizen. Uh, and it, it was really, I'm paraphrasing, if you know where you have come from, the limitations to where you are going are limitless. Uh, another way of looking at it is if you don't know where you have come from, uh, you really don't know where you're going to. Now, uh, Africa, and we've been discussing a lot about Africa, is a very complex uh, construct. I've lately been reflecting on the notion that, uh, and I'm speaking on this from a Kenyan perspective, I'm Kenyan, uh, middle class, uh, fairly privileged in my opinion. Uh, and speaking from that context, I've been reflecting lately that uh, without uh, a, a conference in 1884, was it 1885 in Berlin, uh, where the scramble and partition of Africa was undertaken and some lines were drawn, uh, this country called Kenya that I uh, defend and speak about with a lot of pride would not exist as those lines uh, indicate, as those lines depict. So really, Kenya is not those lines. Kenya is not those boundaries. Uh, so what really is Kenya? What's, what's the city? And I, I just want to try and walk you through a couple of my sketches. Uh, so I sketch from life a lot. And this sketch is from the top of uh, one of Nairobi's iconic buildings called Kenya uh, KICC, Kenya International Conference Center, and uh, looking across. And this is the sort of things I was sketching and beginning to feel that uh, there's a development in Nairobi. You have lots of buildings, you have skyscrapers coming up. There you might see one of them there that I'm indicating called Britain Towers, which pretty much looks like uh, Freedom Towers in, in the US, you have uh, Ramtula Towers, you have KCB, and you have this wonderful series of skyscrapers coming up in Nairobi. And a lot of the times when you sketch from the top of KICC, this is what you see. This is a different view uh, looking across into some more skyscrapers. And one of the interesting things for me, and I might say in some... Uh, yeah, and, and, and th th this is a bit easy because when I'm sketching this, a lot of the times I'm sketching shapes. I'm actually sketching rectangles. Uh, I, and, I, and I don't want to say easy from the perspective that uh, I'm showing off, just easy from the perspective that these are lines, these are shapes. I'm so far removed from the city. I am well above, I've taken almost a plain view and I'm looking at it. There are interesting reflections still that come out of it. Uh, but what I see is almost what I was expecting to see. Uh, this is a slightly different view, and it's from uh, Uhuru Park. And uh, the building in the middle there is actually the KICC, Kenyatta International Conference Center. And that's where I was at the top sketching the others. And this took me down a little bit and began to understand, uh, just began to think up and reflect a little bit more. Uh, and especially when you're looking at cities and when you go into some of these public parks, I think it was the mayor of, former mayor of Bogota, who said that one of the biggest differences in, uh, in the wealth gaps happens at recreation, at the point of recreation. And that's where public space becomes important because the wealthy, uh, especially in nations that are very disparate, uh, the wealthy are able to uh, pay for recreation and uh, the not so fortunate have to actually recreate in public spaces. And I was actually in this park and I began to reflect. I'd not really been to this park for 10 plus years. I went there because I was out there to sketch, but it caused me to start thinking the water feature, is it being used to its full uh, maximum? Uh, sitting in the park, looking out to the town, what are you really thinking through? But this, and you notice this is around 2017, this began to push me a little bit uh, to this, which is actually the city. This is actually Nairobi. This is actually uh, urban life uh, in Kenya. And the vast majority of people uh, live in what I refer to as the uh, 50 by 100, 40 by 80 plot. Uh, 
And when I've looked at it initially, I looked at it with a certain amount of disdain uh, because we felt that people are overbuilding, they're overcrowding, they're not following zoning regulations. Uh, but there's an interesting question that also began to emerge as I was sketching. Where did I want all these people to go if they were not going to be able to uh, live in uh, a 50 by 100? Uh, if they can't live in a single family house like my privileged self, where did I want them to go? Did I not want them to come into the city? Uh, and since they came into the city, then what? And then there were certain other reflections that I began to get. Uh, I happened to be in Barcelona in 2018 and began to realize that it's actually a very dense uh, uh, urban city. And that really uh, a focus on the streets, a focus on the park, uh, was really what drives and creates an interest and how can we begin to look at uh, some of these areas uh, and some of this density and reflection and focus a lot more on what is happening on the street and beginning to help define that, define public spaces, define parks, and really what you then end up with a, a fairly attractive uh, city, which can also... Uh, which is also affordable. One of the things with this sketch is that I am then able to throw in a little bit of green, paint that out. That's not really the way it looks, but I imagined that with that green, suddenly there's a bit of an attraction that comes in. Uh, I'm hoping I'm keeping time, just trying to go through this fairly quickly. And this is another one now where I have now really come down and I'm sitting in a little outdoor uh, kiosk. Uh, and enjoying a meal. I think uh, they offered me sugar cane juice on these days with hibiscus, which was extremely sharp. Uh, but this is really where several of the city dwellers live. And this is a street. Uh, and we don't have any standards, any design standards around creating this sort of spaces in our streets. There's a desire and an ambition to almost create streets, and I say this with as much sensitivity as possible, that were created from the colonial constructs, which imagined large boulevards uh, with few people maybe uh, taking a constitutional, and the standards the word for taking a walk, uh, and where you can, uh, you know, uh, ride a bike, whatever. But in this particular case, this street, and you'll notice a couple of bikes there because I was cycling, this street is actually providing a very interesting uh, character. Uh, there's a butchery, uh, there's a little restaurant. Uh, I think if I remember right, there might even have been a phone shop, but it was alive and it was vibrant and it had people from all different classes. And I began to wonder in a true mixed use development, in a true mixed use city, how then would we be able to accommodate this? What sort of urban design guidelines would we develop uh, that would then allow this to flourish as well as uh, all the other important aspects around sanitary, around environmental uh, resilience, uh, around making sure the street is well uh, uh, lit and safe. Uh, but I think what I am trying to get to is sketching for me has really become a way to see. When I sit and uh, sketch in a number of these places, it forces me to see things and think through things and really ask myself, where do I come from? And thus, what, uh, where do I want to get to? And what, will, what limits are this that I have put into myself uh, beforehand that I can now uh, 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 break down. Uh, I think just a couple more quickly as I finish. This one is a little town, uh, I think Keroka. And for me, the most fascinating thing was just the sheer number of umbrellas. And uh, I reflected that I have never asked students to design a street with umbrellas, yet that's what happens. Uh, <laughs> I asked them to design 
but where's the space for all the other things? I would still love to see some street trees. There's a lot of signage there. There's, but it's it is so vibrant and so interesting. And this is we don't want to lose this, and we want to make sure that we can uh, capture this plus capture the best uh, of other worlds. Uh, it's another view. Uh, sorry, not, this is a different view. This this one is in pipeline. I think this one is currently on my social media post. And uh, on this day, I think uh, I, one of the most interesting things, you notice in the sketch, there are all those little red uh, things uh, which were depicting clothes hanging off uh, uh, balconies. And until this day, until the day I sketched this, I absolutely detested the idea of clothes hanging off balconies. I really do not know why. And I've been asking that question around. I find young kids who also don't like it. And I think it comes from architects disliking uh, their elevations being destroyed. And that was one thing. I didn't want my elevation destroyed. It was also something that supposedly poor people do because they don't have washing machines. Uh, they don't have dryers. Uh, they don't have large spaces to hang their clothes. Uh, you, and so, I realized that in all our affordable housing thoughts, we were just wondering, our big thing was, how do we make sure we get rid of the clothes? And from the, uh, and, and that's the smallest of the problems, in my opinion. There are some real problems, genuinely, about the clothes. It might drip on somebody walking down on the street below. That's a genuine problem. Somebody else told me it uh, means that you need to uh, maintain the house more often because it's, uh, it's, it messes up the facade, it breaks things down. That's fine, we can discuss all those things. But really the question now is where, what's the origin of our dislike? What's the origin of our bias? What's the origin of our, without romanticizing these spaces, because get, don't get me wrong, this is also difficult situations because the people here are desperate uh, for a certain, type of uh, uh, living. Uh, but that's, we need to be clear to disaggregate the real problems from our own biases and desires uh, around what we would like to see in the city. I think I'll, I'll want to stop there. I don't know if I've gone 15 minutes or more, uh, but there are a few other sketches and we can keep discussing those later. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much, Arthur. I wish I knew how to play this thing, but holding it makes me feel like I can play it. So those two are for you, Arthur. Great job. Thank you very much for revealing to us and to the world the real, I actually usually call it the real Nairobi. So, oh, the real uh, cities. I happen to have grown up in a, a similar situation. These ones were not high rising, but we were close to each other as commonly called uh, slums. Well, uh, <laughs> no problem. I think if someone just walked through the city, they may miss this uh, nitty gritty, they may miss this. But I, above all, I like what uh, you said, uh, the question that you have offered to us. What is the origin of our perspectives? And therefore, the bias, where does it come from? Um, I, I, I'll grab on that for a couple of minutes. But anyway, thank you for you know, sharing all these sketches and for revealing to us uh, what, urban, uh, what art can reveal about urban spaces. And now let us also cross over to Liberia. It is Afrocentric crossing over now to Liberia, uh, where we can see the urban sketches. And uh, yeah, listen to the video, thank you. Hopefully it works. Yes, the tech people are working. Now, let me speak in here. I'm going to focus on this quarter aspect of it, the African quarter of it. Now, coming to our quarter like you're here, 
There are so many of us here. We have brothers, we have sisters, we have mothers, we have fathers that were raised in Nigeria here, we were born here, we were raised here, but we got educated in the States, we got educated in the Western world, we got Western education. But they are also Liberians, right? When they come back here, they are also welcome here. So, no matter what you do, Okay, okay, very good. All right, it's very thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so she's saying that all painters are different, right? And what else? What is the second point you stressed on? Oh, anything you draw is beautiful. It doesn't matter what you draw, as long as you do it, it's gonna be beautiful if you put some heart and passion to it, right? Mm, very good, very good. Someone so, else? Any other keywords? Yes, yes, you. Okay, I learned that from the painting or from what he explained, I learned that no matter where you from or you can never depart from your, your roots, no matter where you go, you always come back. Be part of the culture and you'll be accepted. Uh, yeah, and it's okay to be part of both cultures, right? Yeah. Liberian and American, or Liberian or any other nationality. My name is Shafiq. Uh, I'm joined here with uh, Artis Sano. Yeah. Uh, we are Urban Sketchers uh, Liberia. Uh, we would like to thank Rise Africa for having us and for letting us uh, share our experience, our artistic experience uh, with all of you. So uh, let me start by introducing, uh, by saying a little bit about uh, what Urban Sketchers is all about. Basically, Urban Sketchers is a non-profitable organization. Uh, uh, they, uh, we, uh, yeah, Urban Sketchers has uh, 300 active groups around the world. Uh, we started Urban Sketchers Liberia four months ago. So one of the rules uh, that Urban Sketchers have that uh, any group that is trying to become an official chapter has to uh, be active for six months. So we still have two months uh, to become an official Urban Sketchers uh, chapter. Uh, Urban Sketchers uh, started, uh, Liberia started uh, with us. There is uh, no other Urban Sketchers group in Liberia at this moment. Uh, so basically what we have done for the past, what we've been trying to do for the past four months is trying to uh, uh, to uh, let people know what Nigeria is. Uh, try to reach out to uh, to uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign communities. Uh, trying to reach out to artists all around Liberia. Uh, trying to advertise for the country and uh, show really how beautiful Liberia is. And uh, uh, we've been uh, very lucky, actually, that we partnered up with a STEAM uh, innovation STEAM program. Innovation. Uh, and we started working with the uh, schools and Liberian children. And uh, we started creating, actually, a space of freedom where, uh, where artists of Liberia can, can uh, create, can uh, express themselves uh we as a group we've been active uh, in terms of uh, uh, showing the history of the places that we visit uh, and uh, we realized we realized 
through our journey, like what Liberia lacks uh, for an artist to be uh, fully active, uh, it lacks art materials. Uh, artists here are all suffering from the lack of art materials. Uh, and uh, basically they, uh, they yani a, big, a big percentage of Liberian artists are relying on house paint to create their art. Uh, some some are lucky that have uh, uh, relatives uh, uh, abroad that can send them material, but some are not. Yeah. And uh, really, this this also motivated us as an artist to, to try and create uh, using new materials or available materials uh, here in the country. So uh, one of our uh, uh, the creations was uh, using sandpaper, sandpaper which already. is uh, very available in the country here uh, and uh, basically if uh, we will show you in a second the, the results of using that in conjunction with either oil pastels uh, and colored pencils, colored pencils. Which, are, which are also available in some stores in the country and they're not very expensive so anyone can have the reach to that uh recently i've also experimented uh, using oil paint on sandpaper so and it worked uh, very fine and actually the effects that we've uh, reached uh, using that uh, was uh, something that is hard actually to achieve in other mediums so uh, so basically from need comes you know the the, the job of an artist or a painter or a someone who likes to create new things and uh, and uh, yeah we've been also posting all of our activities on social media and uh, we're trying to reach out as we said to to urban sketchers communities around the world to artists around the world to artists all over Liberia to try and grow our community uh, and uh, try to make a change so uh, let's share with you a little bit more I'm sorry Let's share with you a little bit more about some of our events. If I can share the screen. Can you allow to share the screen? We can see a screen. Okay. You can see it? Yes, it just need to be uh, maybe full screen, but we can see from the screen. Okay, and you can see my computer. Uh huh. Okay. So basically, uh, this is our uh, group on Instagram. It's called USA Liberia. Uh, as we said, we started our uh, group on uh, the first event was six February two thousand twenty one. And uh, you can check out uh, the activity, but uh, this is yani, the first event that we had had over 20 artists and it was great uh, really to discover a lot, a lot, a lot of talent. For example, this is Cyrus Cooper, he's one of the most uh, active uh, members in the group and he has an art studio in town. Uh, this is another sketch by another artist. Jira. Uh, by Jora, who's an, also an architect, uh, and uh, really we we don't impose the media that the artist should use. An artist can use any media that they want, any media that's available to them, uh, and uh, and try to uh, to express uh, uh, the Liberian landscape or the theme. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group. We we are always in contact with each other. We decide on events uh, all together. We uh, each one can propose a different event to do each week. So we're not limited with uh, you know anyone taking a decision. We're all taking decisions together. We're all trying to to make this happen together. And uh, let's move forward and then we started going to uh, different parks in Liberia trying to motivate people to go Chevron. to parks uh, this is the Chevron park uh, then we also went to Providence, uh, Providence Island, Island. Mr. Russell, please. yes would you like to tell us a little bit about Providence Island yeah Providence okay. Island uh, as you, you, you know when the 
it's a place where you know uh, free slaves were you know were gathered you know before they had been shipped to you know different continents. So, so called Prevalent Island. Yes, this so. tells a lot about the history of uh, Liberia when the free slaves were shipped from the states so the to states, sure. the Providence Island, yeah. where they then scattered all around Liberia and yeah. populated the area. Sure. So we're trying to, to, to focus where we go on the history of the places because it really holds significant uh, information about how Liberia was established. And we're using you know, art to try and uh, motivate people to listen to us. So, uh, and we're having a lot of people join us every time. So we're not the same group, anyone can join. Uh, it's totally free of charge. Uh, you just come uh, to the event, we sketch all together. For example, on our seventh, uh, seventh Me event, Me uh, we, uh, the vice president heard of us, so she decided to come and see what we're all about. And she was very impressed by, uh, by uh, how motivated we are to try really and make a change. So, uh, uh, so then we had an event, for example, joining uh, on Zoom. Uh, joining us was uh, Urban Sketchers Lebanon. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and this also helps expand and, and really get artists here uh, connected to, to other artistic groups or other artistic activities happening elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, and this connectivity is, is very fruitful at all times because we learn from each other's cultures. We, we, uh, we try and uh, understand the art from different points of views, from, from different countries. Yeah. And, and really you can see how, how much we are alike by the art that we produce because no matter where you are, we all, we all use the same colors. So, uh, so this is really the spirit of how we, we are trying to, to, to look at this or approach this. And we, as I said, we, were, we are also partnering up with uh, the STEAM Innovation Program, which is basically under the Met Africa 4D organization, which is an organization that's been established in the States, trying to connect also the labor foreign Liberians to, to Liberia. So, uh, so uh, this is actually proven to be very fruitful, especially that we're working with uh, different schools around the area right now. Basically, we, we might not be giving full mentoring, artistic mentoring system to, to one specific child. Uh, although we are in specific areas where we find that child always showing up and always trying to make a uh, 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 yani an, uh, yani intervention by himself. A creative but, on your own. Yes, yeah. but uh, out of creative, yeah. but I feel just by just by spread, spreading the message of art and just by showing other children that yes, it's okay to create, it's it's okay to express yourself. You have uh, these tools to express yourself. And the, also the children that we are choosing from the schools uh, also are being chosen that they want, they like arts, they like drawing. So basically, let me show you a video where we went to the school and chose the children. Uh, like we went into the classes and we started uh, uh, choosing the children that are gonna participate in our uh, event. Uh, just by actually, we want them to be interested in arts, you know, that we want them to, but I don't think I have a video on Instagram, I think I can face it. So, uh, so anyways, the other, uh, the other side of what we're trying to accomplish is also uh, uh, advertising for Liberian artists in the area that are maybe uh, struggling to get attention or get the, the exposure that they need. So uh, we started visiting each other's uh, working studio and get the people uh, to know where we're located, get the people to see what we are doing. 
uh, and uh, and also visiting the communities of these artists and try to see uh, where they uh, yeah and they try to understand what are they trying to say in their in their art from the community that they live in. So uh, yeah. For me, and also the, 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 the visit of the studios of each artist too, you know that, right? Yes. Yeah. So, could you like awesome. to add anything? No, but not anything much. I can't say more than what you have already said. You know, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's something here. Yeah. <laughs> it's something you no know, sense or we saw the uh the uh, urban sketches and it's something we never had idea about. Traffic here yeah, is a Lebanese here. Yeah, you know, it came and put us together to really, you know, do this thing. But uh, many found it to be somehow, you know, it's not profitable, no, you know, it, uh, going outside to be sketching all the time, people have no interest. And uh, they, you know, you have to convince them, you know, this is not about interest, but it's something that it will lead you to an opportunity tomorrow, you know. Like what we're seeing here, uh, uh, even give her the opportunity to meet, you know, librarian artists in group to meet the vice president. It was the first time. And what to that uh, steam innovation and when we, we went there we talked you know the issues so what we are doing you know we are we were really motivated and uh, we told her that actually the we lack of material and she too she lost art in uh for a long time even the time she was the first lady of the country when her, her husband was president and uh, she used to really uh, sponsor you know in art and now she even uh, promised us that Actually, she will really be working in line with us. She will really be with us, you know, with this uh, sketching activity. And she very, she is very much interested. But concerning materials, she said actually now Liberia like, to find art material like Shapiro was saying it's not it's not easy. Even me, I'm a portrait portraitist. I do portrait. I don't think I can do. I mean, I think I can do sketch. But in the in doing portrait, the material I use, I can tell you. So now, if I get a uh, tip, tip can spend years with me. You know, I using it. And uh, what I can do uh, specifically is this. I use, you know, house material, house paint. Let me see. I process house paint in a, in a way that I will be able to get a, a tube and that be able to use it. This is the only material that we are depending on. We use house, I mean, house uh, paint mixed with a uh, vivid uh, grease, powder, other thing, you know, to be, you know, see the, you know, to feed the texture like a tube. So you use it to start the painting, the first post, second post, until when you are uh, reaching to the finishing, it's very good to the tube. So we have to use tube in a you know, very you know, minimal way so that at least the view will be. But like you're here, you will wake up. If you got money, you go around all over, you can, you can find materials. So actually, she promised all that. You know, the vast, the vast person, she promised all that, you know, she will ready to find means to go to Ghana, at least to get material for us. And uh, we are very much happy that Within the uh, urban schedule, we are seeing something hopeful in the future. Although, what we're yeah. doing, you know, we're doing it for people to see us and know us, and uh -huh. it's very much important. Uh, and to add a word to shopping. Yeah. All you. All you. We appreciate it. Indeed. Indeed. Now you also have an opportunity to sh share your work to the wider part of Africa. Today uh, we have uh, we got an opportunity to see the amazing work that you are doing, and as you were, you know, showing all these wonderful uh, uh, artistic impressions in my head, still the question was running: What is the role of art in shaping urban identities, cultures, lifestyles, and the urban urban environments? And there you are touching children, you know, reaching out to children and reaching out to the uh, corridors of power. So I, I, I noticed that art is even helping us to access or you to access the corridors of power. So if I ever get a chance to come to Liberia, I'll make sure that you guys introduce me to the vice president uh, so that I can get to shake uh, the vice president's hand. But anyhow, <laughs> thank you. Sure. But I uh, thank you very much for reaching out uh, and for doing the art, for promoting art, for changing the face of art. Uh, and even much more, I think there's much uh, many things that are promising, especially when art has opened the door to the corridors of power. Thank you very much, Urban Sketchers, uh, for sharing that. Talking about sketching, with my limited art knowledge, 
sketching. We have been having someone who has been busy scribbling things down. So it is time for us to know what have you been doing, Bethel? Bethel, who are you and what have you been doing? Uh, moving over to you, Bethel. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, first, I'll also like to acknowledge my fellow cartoonists, um, uh, Maya and uh, Khalid, who are also in the audience busy sketching uh, throughout the, 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 the workshop. Um, I'm Bethwell, uh, I'm a cartoonist from South Africa. I work for the African News Agency. Um, how I became a cartoonist, I started as a fine artist a few years ago, and uh, I'm a self-taught cartoonist. So I used to copy uh, professional cartoonists in newspapers, teaching myself how to draw. And, you know, like coming from a poor background, I used to, um, uh, during my, when I was doing uh, fine arts at, uh, it used to be called Vest Technicon then, now it's called the University of Johannesburg. Then I used to work at the art shop making candles and uh, so I can buy food, you know. So, but then during that time I used to, you know, like I developed the love for cartoons. So uh, while copying those cartoons and then I was struggling at school because I didn't have money to buy food. So I decided to go to almost all the newspapers in um, in Johannesburg uh, to submit my portfolio, including um, uh, magazines. And you know, it took me uh, almost a year till I got a response from uh, one of them. But uh, I didn't give up. Uh, finally, one of uh, the top uh, newspaper Sunday newspapers gave me an opportunity. They said, "You know what? We like your style." why don't you come and do cartoons uh, for the Sunday world? So my career as a cartoon started there. And uh, after two years of working for the Sunday world, I got um, an opportunity. I got a call from the French Institute. They said, we saw your cartoons in, in the newspaper and we think you are doing very well. So we want you to uh, come to France so they selected me and two of the top cartoonists in the country. We went to France to uh, represent South Africa. And that was my first time, you know, flying in an airplane. So it was a, you know, it was like a movie to me. And also I got a chance to meet the person who was behind um, my you know, me becoming a cartoonist, you know, there's a famous cartoonist, I'm sure some of you might know him, his name is Zapiro, he's a famous cartoonist in South Africa. So I used to copy him and I thought this guy is a black person. So when I finally met him in France, I, 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 I saw him and he was a white person. And, <laughs> you know, like, like for me, yeah, it was a, a very, um, it was a dream come true and yeah, it was something out of this world. So um, also the purpose of us or me and my colleagues being here, like uh, as uh, Eddie has said, we were capturing whatever that you were saying as artists, uh, interpreting whatever that you were doing and put it in uh, a cartoon which um, you will be able to see sometime, uh, I'm sure at the end of the week, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yesterday I managed to join uh, uh, the first workshop and I was uh, very inspired by the panelists, what they said, you know, talking about Africa, how we can uh, uh, make the, of Africa com uh, compete with the rest of the world, you know, and it just showed me that as artists, we play a, a very um, a big role from musicians, uh, poetry, architecture, going back to where um, like recently, like today, uh, one of the previous uh, 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 participants said that art is a form of healing. So, and it also reminded me of what 
the other participants, just as I said, they touched on one of the, the, the topics that I love, the art of Kintsugi. The art of Kintsugi is uh, joining piece, broken pieces together um, using uh, uh, gold. And you know that's a form of healing. As artists, we draw uh, cartoons using few lines, um, using color, and we put those broken lines into something that when you look at it and you smile, you know, so we are also playing that uh, part of healing. I don't know if uh, uh, I didn't, uh, 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 I, I thought you'll also uh, display some of the, the work that I have done. Um, It was a. It was let me let me let me, okay. let me let me let me try to upload it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mange. It's also uh, interesting how, as artists, we share one thing. It, when Arthur was talking about uh, architecture and how um, uh, people who hang uh, their stuff on the balconies mess up their artwork. You know, even for me or any painter, when you, you've you just done your masterpiece and someone uh, comes and uh, puts something on your work, you know, like you, you become uh, frustrated or you, you know, you feel like... These are some of the uh, cartoons that we did uh, with my colleagues uh, representing the cartoon collections. So, And this is one, one of the cartoons that I, I love as well. I hope um, some of the people in the background um, didn't just mummify themselves as we the presenters are busy uh, uh, talking. And, you know, I've also learned, you know, through um, these uh, workshops, you know, like I learned so much from uh, different panelists. And I've also learned, you know, like every time when you, someone said, you know, when you laugh, you know, you are revealing a, a part of you. And, you know, that also um, uh, is something that I, I relate, you know, I love uh, smiling, I love laughing because every time I do that, you know, it brings me joy, even, you know, I could be sad and yeah. Oops. Thank you, thank you, Bethwell. And uh, indeed, as uh, as Bethwell has just mentioned, um, they several cartoonists, two other cartoonists, cartoon artists are going to be illustrating, and then we'll get an opportunity uh, to to see what they have illustrated, as Paul indicated. Um, so, if you're interested, and I hope you are, please uh, uh, tune in and uh, watch out for the link. Uh, and you'll be able to get a chance to comment, to look uh, at what has been illustrated and comment on, uh, on, uh, on the cartoons themselves. Uh, Bethel, before I, I, I leave you, um, in, in uh, a sentence or in a word, how do you see the role of cartoon artists, the illustrations from cartoon artists, um, what is your role in building in uh, uh, the urban narrative uh, in Africa? Um, as a political cartoonist, what I've noticed that you know there are so many uh, issues in the African continent. Some are uh, you know good stories that we celebrate. We do cartoons and people laugh, and sometimes we reflect on very serious issues. You know, like the terrorism that's happening uh, in parts of Africa. When you do that, someone will say, uh, but that cartoon is not funny. But at the end of the day, we sometimes you do a cartoon not to make someone laugh, but as a form of protest 
so someone can act and help change uh, uh, the, 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 the continent. It seems we lost Mangena, and um, Arthur, are you there to uh, to share a brief reflection on the question that uh, was asked? Um, oh yeah, thank you very much for 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 answering. But uh, yeah, you you may use a minute to to say something about that question about the role of art. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thanks a lot, Eddie. Uh, it was a fantastic question, as I was, uh, and one that we may not be fully able to answer just now. Uh, really, the question was that uh, most of the traditional cultures used art as an expression. Uh, I mean, as functionality, paintings on buildings for protection, music, dance, different seasons, body painting. Uh, what we have now is really more art for viewing and cultural expression as a display. And I just thought it was a very interesting observation. Uh, and uh, maybe it's interesting to think when we looked at that, we looked at what they were doing as art, uh, but in actual sense, they were actually doing something functional. It was uh, a means of research, it was a means of protection. It was, you, uh, I'm not sure how to refer to it exactly, but it was really relevant. And I, want to say I see a little bit of that in what I am actually doing uh, because I've had a lot of questions when I post sometimes and people ask me oh do you paint to sell do you uh, why do you go sit in a lonely corner of town and sketch and I was really telling them I, I just feel that I'm a researcher at that point I am uh, trying to understand how my city is built up, the building blocks of my city. I'm trying to understand how things are built up. And so I don't necessarily see myself as an artist. I see myself as a researcher. And the result uh, is sometimes some art. Uh, and in thinking about where we've come from and who we are, maybe that's a very interesting question, both to see how to get more and more people interested in art and also interested in science, uh, in that if we stop making these things uh, something that is for a dedicated few, but for everybody to participate in, uh, perhaps it will be a lot uh, better and more interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I hope Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a question that needs more pondering and thought. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with you. Uh, that's not a question that you can answer in a, a few minutes that we have. As we come to the end of this particular session, I just wanted to remind you that if there is anyone there, either in the audience or in the panel, who is experienced in conducting marriages, we have one that we have agreed that needs to be conducted today. That's marrying art and science to build the urban, uh, the urban future that we want. Uh, so if you are there, and I guess all of us should be uh, working towards that. And I think also the cartoon artists do well uh, at the Red Cross Climate Center. We have worked with the cartoon artists to communicate climate risks and inspire actions, both at the local level, even at the uh, you know, higher level. I think that's one way that we could marry art uh, and science and, and get something that is much, much, much better. Well, uh, thank you all of you for joining. And um, please uh, don't forget um, to register. And uh, my, friend, my colleague, I think, has already, uh -huh, yeah. Yes, someone has already posted it down there. Please uh, don't forget to register for the Action Fest Festival and then watch the inspiring video provocations. I would love to watch uh, to watch them and uh, vote for your favorite in the photo competition. Uh, why not make your voices heard? Uh, yet we have been talking here about making voices heard. And finally, rate this session and add a comment to, the, to an action. And uh, as a way of leaving and saying goodbye, I would like to invite the panelists to switch on your, your cameras if you can, and if it is appropriate, 
thank you very much. And then uh, if you just look under your seats, there is a, your seat where you are seated. We hid there a special gift uh, for our for our webinar uh, viewers and those ones who posted questions. Yeah, please pick it up, pick it up. Urban Sketchers, uh, I am imagining that you are doing it also there. And yes, uh, thank you, Arthur. Thank you, uh, Bethwell. And let us just send it through the camera. If it is big, I'm very sure it can be compressed. And over to you, all of you, our participants. Uh, thank you very much for being a part of this. And keep enjoying Rise Africa event. And goodbye. Thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon, a lovely morning. I don't know if there are those who are enjoying the morning and evening and see you in other sessions. Goodbye.